Okay, so we have a lot to discuss from July. Never settle. That's the philosophy here at Revolut. It's been a busy month for Revolut. They went live in New Zealand, launched joint accounts in the UK, and we have an update on their banking license. Chase UK looks set to launch in Germany, and Monzo might also have a go at Europe and merge with a Danish digital bank whose investors include Ron Burgundy. <gasps> oh! Great Odin's Raven! We've also got a new leading travel card and a lot of updated savings accounts. Dame Alison Rose has stepped down as chief executive of NatWest. Finally, we'll discuss Nigel Farage and his recent issue with NatWest and Coots and how it may actually have a positive impact on banking regulation. But first, Revolut. Back in April, we announced that Revolut were introducing joint accounts across Europe. Well, now we have them in the UK. There's nothing really unique in terms of features, but they are really easy to set up. In the app, you just visit the hub, click join, and then confirm. The only downside is that you can only invite someone from the same country as you, so you can't share a joint with a foreigner. Revolut is now live in New Zealand and has signed up 26,000 Kiwis. That is a lot of vitamin C. <laughs> That's not funny. I'm sorry. It is good news though for New Zealanders because apparently 40% of them do not trust their banks. And the ones that are sending money internationally are reportedly losing out to high fixed fees and hidden fees, all of which they could avoid by using Revolut or Monito.com. That's because our comparison engine would show them the cheapest, fastest, and overall best provider for their international transfer. Now, Revolut's banking license application has gone a bit quiet, although The Telegraph were still able to publish this article, which is basically something about nothing. Revolut's founder and CEO, Nikolai Storonsky, and their chairman met with Minister Andrew Griffith. The point of the conversation was to talk about Revolut's expansion plans, and it had nothing to do with the license. Except the Telegraph did make it seem as if Nikolai raised the point in an attempt to get help from the minister. But if you dive in, it's clear that the topic may have briefly come up, but Storonsky said that the outcome of the application is very much in his and Revolut's hands, which I think is a good thing. Do you remember back in May when we thought it was over, the Bank of England was set to reject the application and Nikolai was going to pull out from the UK? Well, now the language is somewhat more positive and the license may just be determined by Revolut's ability to clean up and conform to the standards of the regulators, so the PRA and FCA. Except there was a little $23 million hiccup this month, which the FCA might not look at too favorably. The FT originally reported on this, and I think it's fascinating. Basically, the hiccup, which has been kept under wraps until now, arose when Revolut's payment system in the US decided to give people money after a declined payment. Cunning criminals took advantage of this by initiating high value transactions that they knew would be declined so that they could then cash out at an ATM. Apparently, they got away with as much as $20 million which is equal to two thirds of what Revolut made in profit in 2021. Obviously this isn't a good look, but it's especially bad in the eyes of the FCA who take crime prevention very seriously when giving consent to a banking license. But this did happen in the US and Revolut are yet to disclose the full details, probably because there's an ongoing investigation. And I still stand by what I said. I think they will get their license, but it'll be predicated on them demonstrating a clean bill of health, not only financially, but also technologically. They must be able to demonstrate to the regulators that issues like this won't arise in the UK. And I imagine that's probably what they're working on right now. That and furthering their goal of becoming a super app. The latest feature being Revolut Experiences, which allows you to book activities and tours in app. For example, you could become a classic touch painting by booking this photo shoot in Amsterdam. I think that looks pretty fun. Finally, Revolut also launched personal loans in Germany, offering between 1,000 and 50,000 euros. Speaking of Germany, JP Morgan Chase, is planning on opening a European hub in Berlin. I believe the intention here is to build and replicate the success of Chase UK across wider Europe. And I think this is really exciting because it will introduce a new level of competition in the EU banking sector. Knowing JP Morgan, they'll likely invest billions into capturing customers and their deposits. I imagine this will mean Chase DE or Chase EU, which is more likely will have high savings rates and offer cash back on everyday spending. Ultimately, this will be a good thing for consumers, not only for those rewards, but also because it will increase market competition. Monzo is also looking to expand in Europe. Apparently, they're exploring a potential merger with Luna. If you don't know, Luna is a digital bank in Europe with over 650,000 customers in Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. Then find the Lunar app and download it to your phone. Ah!
He didn't have the app. They're known for having Will Ferrell as an investor and like Monzo, they don't have physical branches. Although they are significantly smaller, which makes me think this would be more of an acquisition and less of a merger. According to Bloomberg, Monzo has also studied other potential targets that would help its European expansion. What's most interesting here is that the consolidation or joining forces of startup digital banks like Monzo and Luna is something that people predicted would happen in order for them to remain competitive. You see, they experienced accelerated growth early on because traditional incumbent banks had become so archaic, their technology was awful and they treated their customers poorly for so long. But now those traditional banks, the likes of HSBC and the retail arm of JP Morgan Chase are modernizing and behaving just like their digital challenger bank counterparts. And the worry for the challenger is that they're not only catching up in terms of technology, but also they have far deeper pockets. They can afford to invest millions into slowing the growth of the Monzos and Lunas of the world and even claw back some of the customers that left them. For example, First Direct, who are essentially HSBC's digital bank in disguise, now offer £175 to switch, a 7% fixed savings account, and recently became a leading travel card. In July, they announced that they were scrapping foreign transaction and withdrawal fees, which means they are just willing to give up that revenue. And when you combine that with their high daily ATM withdrawal limit of £500 and the fact they use MasterCard's exchange rates, First Direct just became one of the leading travel cards in the UK. And you could even argue that they're better than Monzo and Starling, which is bad news for them because a big part of their value proposition is that they are a great travel card and that's what made them so easy to recommend. As of today, the 31st of July, Paragon Bank has become the leading easy access savings account in the UK. Although you can only withdraw twice, Next up though is Oak North. In the UK, we're beginning to see more fixed savers rising above 6%, although with the Bank of England set to meet again on the 3rd of August and many predicting they'll raise the base rate by 0.25%, I think there's little incentive to lock in right now. Wise interest is back at the top for GBP deposits, but remember, it's not a savings account, it's a low risk fund. It does, however, share some similarities with an easy access account. Your money isn't locked up, there are no commitments, and you can withdraw at any time without a penalty. What I personally love about Wise Interest is that the rate is basically pegged to the base rate. So at the moment, it's 4.54%, but if the Bank of England were to increase interest rates, then this Wise rate will most certainly increase. That's why I've been using it, because I just can't be bothered to keep moving my money from account to account, trying to keep up with the best rates. I also plotted this graph, which you might find interesting and found wise interest for GBP balances has really led the charge since the end of last year, at least when compared to some of the providers we talk about on this channel. There are fees, but these are factored into the rate. And if you're interested in opening a wise account, then please consider using the link in the description box below. That's an affiliate link, so by using it, you'll be supporting myself and the channel. Now, for those that aren't aware, Nigel Farage is an ex-politician. He was a pretty prominent figure in the Brexit movement, but now he works in the media. He's often in the press, but over the past few weeks, he's had an explosion of exposure. Basically, Nigel went public stating that his Coots bank account was unfairly closed. Coots is a bank marketed to the wealthy. It's owned by NatWest, and to open an account, I believe you need to have at least one million pounds in investments or three million in savings. So the BBC and FT initially reported saying that the accounts were closed because they fell below those financial thresholds. They're telling the press I don't meet their wealth threshold. Well, they've never mentioned that before and Coots are frankly being very, very dishonest. Indeed. But Nigel Farage immediately shot back saying that they were lying and the real reason he was cut off was politically driven and that he'd been a victim of blatant corporate prejudice, which turned out to be somewhat true. Through a subject access request, Nigel was able to get hold of his personal data and Coots had been collecting tweets and quotes from interviews by Nigel that they considered to be by association negative press. Within the dossier, it references that he endorses Trump, it makes suggestions that he's pro-Russian and also categorizes some of his communication as climate denying. But it also says that despite these apparently negative views, from a legal perspective, Nigel Farage hasn't done anything wrong. Coots basically found no suspicious activity. And this is where the problems begin to arise. Because I think we can all agree, given how important a bank account is, unless someone is proven to have done something illegal, banks shouldn't be closing accounts. 
Now, did Coots do this? Because there's always two sides to every story. Well, this is where it becomes a bit ambiguous because the dossier does say that while the relationship between them and Farage was below their commercial criteria, they did weigh up the commercial interest of keeping him against those negative characterizations and came to the conclusion that he just wasn't worth the risk. Basically, when it came to Nigel Farage, the juice wasn't worth the squeeze. So you could argue that if he had been a billionaire, they may not have closed his accounts or that their decision wasn't entirely based on his political viewpoints, except they did create a 40 page document outlining those views. So the evidence is pretty damning. I think they felt that Nigel Farage basically didn't align with their branding and under the guise of commercial interest, they ousted him. And look, I'm sure Nigel will be okay. He's well connected, has a very loud voice and is unafraid to go public. But the same can't be said about the thousands if not millions of other people that have a far quieter voice and have had their bank accounts closed without reason. Which must be terrifying because in this day and age, a bank account is as important to us as water. I know it sounds extreme, but it is getting that way because we're living in a society that's becoming more and more cashless. So having your account closed without proper reason for an individual or a business would be crippling. Apparently 1,000 accounts are closed every day and between 2021 and 2022, 343,000 were closed down. And I think that we can be certain that some of those were closed because of nefarious activities, but over the years, there have been plenty of confirmed cases of banks unfairly closing accounts. And they don't even have to give proper justification at least until now. Because since the fallout with Farage, the government is accelerating already proposed new rules. The Treasury will go further and make banks and building societies give customers three months notice of account closures. In short, banks should give at least 90 days notice and improve transparency over why. Essentially giving someone the opportunity to either right any wrong or say no, that's entirely incorrect. I personally think all decisions to close an account should be subject to an independent review and there should even be an appeal system. And until the accused are actually found guilty of illegal behavior, they should still have access to basic banking. Perhaps there should be a mechanism in place to close an account if it's for an extreme reason, such as, I don't know, financing terrorism, but really a bank shouldn't be able to just cut someone off. Just like how utility companies can't cut you off from your electricity or water. Let me know what you think of this. Do you think banks should have less power to close accounts or does this just go against the principles of a free market and create precedent for more government intervention? I personally never expected this story to have the impact it's had, but regardless of what you think of him, I'd say Nigel Farage has had somewhat of a positive impact on the banking sector. Hope you enjoyed this month's recap. Give it a thumbs up if you did, and please consider subscribing to the channel. We're almost at 10,000 subscribers, so it would be amazing if you could help us reach that milestone. See you in the next video. Goodbye.